So good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Town Board of the Town Austin special meeting and work session for Tuesday, October 6th, 2020. Please rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Um, sorry. Uh, Councilmember Feldman? Present. Councilmember Shaw? Present. Councilmember Meyer? Present. Councilmember Wilcher? Present. And Supervisor Levenberg? I'm here. Thank you so much, Victoria Caffarelli. And we're going to just start off with some announcements. Um, I have to put on my little prop. This is my prop. I don't know if you can see it. But today, uh, Team Austin gathered to kick off Organ Donor Enrollment Day, which is scheduled for this Thursday, October 8th. For the fifth year in a row, the town is partnering with Live on New York, for this one day event with a single goal in mind to register as many willing New Yorkers as organ donors as possible. One organ donor can save up to eight lives and countless others with life saving tissue donations. Unfortunately, New York State has continued to have some of the lowest numbers of registered organ donors in the country, while also having some of the highest need. Almost 10,000 people um, a year are on the wait list for uh, life-saving organ transplants. Together, we can change this. In fact, polls show that most New Yorkers support organ and tissue donation, so now they can put their checkbox where their heart is. This Thursday is the day. This year, we have dreamed up a special, totally virtual way to connect with people instead of our usual tabling events around town. We're hosting a self-titled, since we came up with the name, Zoomathon. You remember Jerry Lewis and his uh, muscular dystrophy telethons? Well, this is a Zoomathon, and instead of asking for money, we're asking for you to sign up as an organ donor on Organ Don Donor Enrollment Day, October 8th. That's this Thursday. Um, and part of our organ donor Zoomathon is going to be interviews with uh, people who have received organ donations themselves and are satisfied customers, and also uh, the families of those people who have received organ donations and have lived on and been able to be part of this world for a little bit longer. So we're also gonna have musical interludes from some of our terrific local musicians, um, which was coordinated by Mike Risco Music. Thanks again for your community support. Um, and you can register to become an organ donor online this year for the first time ever. If you do, and we are hoping you do, be sure to use Team Austin's exclusive link at donatelife.ny.gov slash ref, R-E-F as in Frank, or referee, slash live on N-Y D-D, that's D as in Dana, D as in Dana, 139 slash. It's a really unpleasant URL, but if you were interested and wanted to see it again, you can just rewind this video if you're watching um, record, this recorded video. We're the only local municipality in our area spearheading a community-wide effort. So let's do what we can to make sure Team Austin secures the highest number of enrollments out of all the teams in the New York region participating this year. Come on, folks. You can't take it with you. Also happening this Thursday, our competition, LOL, County Executive George Latimer is having his State of the State address on the Westchester County Government Facebook page. If you need more information about getting access to it on your computer or if you do not have a Facebook account, fear not. The county will walk you through how you can access the live stream. And if you get distracted, you can always hop over to our organ donor live stream and sign up. This Friday, October 9th, is the last day to register for something else critically important, to vote in the November general election. It's easy to register online. Just visit citizenparticipation.westchestergov.com. 
If you are not sure if you are registered to vote, you can also check your voter registration status on that webpage. Don't wait until it is too late. October 9th, this Friday, is the last day, as I already mentioned. For this November's election, New York voters have several options. They can vote by absentee ballot, vote in person early, starting October 24th, and you can vote in person on election day on November 3rd. Visit the Board of Elections website, and again, that's citizenparticipation.westchestergov.com for a complete listing of all the early polling uh, location, all the early voting locations that you can go to, and also so you can check where your polling site will be on election day since some people have been relocated this year. All voters in Westchester County can go to any of the 17 early voting sites across the county, but on election day, you must vote at your assigned polling place. If you um, haven't received a postcard yet, you should be receiving a postcard soon from the Board of Elections telling you exactly where that polling place is and also containing a QR code on that postcard that you can bring with you into your polling place and then they can scan it and it will speed up the registration process a little bit. Also, hours vary for early voting, um, so make sure you check out that website. We will share that information with you as we get a little bit closer in a couple weeks. If you are planning to vote by absentee ballot, the deadline for requesting an absentee ballot online, uh, postmark, email, or fax is October 27th. You can apply in person for an absentee ballot up to the day before the election, which is November 2nd, the day before the election. To return your ballot, you have a few options via mail if postmarked by November 3rd, hand delivering to Westchester County Board of Elections on Quarapus Street in White Plains by November 3rd, or you can actually bring it to one of the early polling locations from October 24th through November 1st or to your polling site on November 3rd. So if you decide, I just want to, I want to vote in person, but I'm not sure what if it's very crowded there and I don't feel like waiting, you can actually bring your absentee ballot filled out with you. And if you don't feel like voting in person, you can just hand the absentee ballot into them at the polling site. So that's another way to do it. Regardless of your political leanings, I think we can all agree this is going to be one of the most important elections in our lifetime. Please make a plan today to vote and ensure your voice is heard in this historic election. Thankfully, COVID cases in our area continue to remain low, but we are starting to see a slight uptick here and also spikes in areas not too far away from us, including in New York City, Rockland, and Orange counties. As we get into the fall season, it remains as important as ever to wear your mask whenever you are in close proximity to others, wash your hands frequently, and get tested if you've been exposed to a positive case. Also, don't forget to get your flu shot because that can also help to reduce um, everybody's risk and also reduce confusion among sicknesses. You can also download the new COVID Alert NY app, which is available for download on your phone's app store for free. The app uses Bluetooth technology to alert users if they've been in close proximity to a positive case. I don't know how it works, but supposedly it does. This app is voluntary, anonymous, and does not use location services, GPS, or geographical information. No personal information will be shared. The app is an easy and savvy way to remain informed of potential exposure, allowing you to self-quarantine immediately, get tested, and reduce potential exposure to your family, friends, neighbors, your coworkers, and others. You must be 18 years or older to use the app. Learn more at coronavirus.health.ny.gov slash COVID-alert-ny. And finally, you thought I was done with the 2020 census. Uh-uh. <laughs> Since our last meeting, a federal judge in California ruled that census operations must continue through October 31st. This is good news because that means that we can increase our numbers of self-reported. We expect the federal government will appeal this decision, so do not wait to respond to the 2020 census. Obviously, you already have waited if you heard me say this and you haven't filled it out yet. The deadline could potentially change on us at any time. Unincorporated Austin currently has a 69.8% self-response rate, just 0.1% away from our 2020, 2010 response rate. Now that we have a few extra weeks to get our numbers up, let's do whatever we can better than we did 10 years ago. 
Ashlyn lost $2,500 per year per person since 2010 for every resident that did not complete the last census. We do not want to leave any money on the table for the next 10 years. Share posts about the importance of the census. Call friends. Ask your, ask your extended family members. The census is a count of all residents, regardless of immigration status, age, or race. It takes only about 10 minutes to complete and is in, available in many languages. So if you or a loved one has not yet filled it out, there are no more excuses. Please do whatever you can to make sure Asin is accurately counted in the 2020 census. Do any of my board colleagues have any other announcements? I say the answer is that they do not, unless they do, and I'm just not waiting. Okay, I say they do not. Okay, so with that, um, may I have a motion to, oh no, I'm sorry, we're starting tonight's work session with a special meeting. September had a fifth Tuesday, so it has been a little while since we last met, and in the meantime, a few important contracts and a new seasonal hire in our town clerk's office um, have come up requiring board action. We have just a few resolutions tonight to tie us over until next Tuesday's regular meeting. So I think I'm going to turn it over to Victoria Caffarelli, unless somebody else has joined us from the clerk's office, and I don't think they have, to take us through our resolutions. Okay. Um, first up, we have approval of contract Sparta Cemetery Grave Repair. Resolve that the Town Board of the Town of Ossining authorizes the supervisor to sign an agreement with the Ossining Historic Cemeteries Conservancy Incorporated, OHCC, and Robert Car Carpenter, Yonkers, New York, for the repair of gravestones in Sparta Cemetery at a cost of $1,250 to be paid for by OHCC at no cost to the town. Do I have a motion? So moved. moved. Second. Second. Um, we're very pleased that Sparta, um, that OHCC has taken on this project to help uh, repair some of our um, historic gravestones at Sparta. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Uh, approval of retainer special counsel result that the town board of the town of Ossining authorizes a supervisor to sign a retainer agreement dated October 1st, 2020 with Leventhal, Mullaney and Blinkoff LLP, Roslyn, New York to provide legal services to the town upon its request. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Um, appointment seasonal intermediate clerk resolved that the town board of the town of Austin appoints Janet Quinnensaka, Cortland Manor, to the seasonal position of part time intermediate clerk in the town clerk's office at an hourly rate of $15, effective October 6, 2020. Good motion. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Approval of contract wellness and nutrition program and nutrition services incentive program, program year 2020 through 2021. Resolve that the town board of the town of Austin authorizes a supervisor to sign a contract with the Westchester County Department of Senior Programs and Services for the purposes of receiving funding for the wellness and nutrition program, WIN, and the nutrition services incentive program, NSIP, for program year 2020 through 2021 at an amount not to exceed $50,069, comprised of $38,000. $1,633 for WIN and $11,436 estimated for NSIP. Do I have a motion? So, second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Um, contract Multimodal Capital Project Agreement. Resolve that the Town Board of the Town of Austin authorizes the supervisor to sign a multimodal capital project agreement with the New York State Department of Transportation for the purposes of receiving $120,000 in grant funds to support the Morningside Drive re repaving project, subject to approval by Council to the Town as to form. Second motion. So moved. Second. Second. We are grateful to Assemblywoman Sandy Galef for directing these multi multimodal funds to the town of Austin and hopeful that we can potentially, well not definitely, uh, get this approved in time to pave this year, but um, it's more likely that it will happen in the spring. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? All right, fantastic. So with that, can I have a motion to adjourn to work session? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay. 
Wonderful. So this evening we have our highway superintendent, Pete Connolly here to discuss the highway department's current and future space needs. Now that Pete has had a little over a year under his belt, he has shared with us that our current facility uh, may not adequately serve the department's needs. As such, it's probably time for us to think long and hard about the future and what steps we may need to take to consider relocating, acquiring additional property, or something else down the line. So Pete, can you uh, share with us some more specifics, please? Sure. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, so tonight, I just want to take a few minutes. Uh, like Dana said, I've, I've been here about uh, 16 uh, months um, to mention what I feel uh, is needed, and that is a larger and improved uh, highway garage and storage yard. Um, for those out there that don't know where we are, we're at the 85 Oak Route 100, which is uh, just south of the shopping center at 9A and North State Road. I mean, uh, you can't miss us because our, our trucks are literally parked right on the edge of the road there. We're so tight here. So um, a little history of where we are um, as far as the building is concerned. Uh, the original north portion of the garage was built in uh, 1928 for an oil company. Um, with the overhead door height there and the roof I-beams inside, uh, that prevents the larger trucks from being stored inside. So approximately just 10 of our over 40 pieces of equipment can be stored in the garage. Uh, the two bay repair garage uh, where the mechanics are was added in the uh, 80s. And uh, due to the limited operating space there, we have two 40 foot trailers, uh, on the side of the building that they use to store their uh, material, you know, and uh, repair parts to keep our vehicles on the road. Um, there was an old uh, wood building here that was shared by the recreation department, uh, parts department, uh, the highway department, and when Ossining had their own police force. And that was torn down about 18 years ago and um, two trailers were brought in, uh, tied together, and they are currently serve as our uh, office for myself, the foreman, our office assistant, and a very, very small locker room. So the property is so tight, uh, there is no room for mis uh, material storage, such as item four, sand, gravel, extra pipe, and uh, catch basins. Um, to that regard, we use two offset uh, storage areas for our seasonal equipment also such as our uh, leaf machines and soil spreaders, and for the uh, surplus town vehicles that are waiting going to auction. Uh, there is no employee parking area here per se, so everybody's car can, is just mixed in with the uh, town trucks. So, the, you know, I just wanted to uh, mention that this evening. Um, we're very, very tight here. Um, just want to keep the board informed on the need that I feel um, we need for a new modern facility, uh, which would serve the town for decades to come. And if a suitable site comes along, uh, you know, I think it would be a good idea if the board would uh, consider it. Okay, thanks so much. And uh, I just will open it up for to the board for questions or comments um, that anybody might have regarding um, the highway department's current uh, state of, <clears throat> Okay, I have a question, a couple. Um, so Pete, how much, how much land and or space do you have now? And how much are you looking to, what do you think would be ideal? What are you looking for? We have now about a um, little less than uh, three quarters of an acre here. I think it's 0.66, I think. Um, ideally, couple of acres the way the uh, lot is situated you know access where we could put uh, bring everything over to us uh, the salt shed and all the other items I, I mentioned for storage so maybe you know an acre and a half two acres again depends how the lot is laid out okay sure. and building space well all right never mind I mean, I, I know that since I started, I, I think one of the first conversations I had when I visited the highway department was, you know, just the problem with the vehicles and the, the trucks not being able to be stored 
um, out of the weather. And obviously they're all exposed. Um, we have a lot of new vehicles, a lot of new trucks. And as they get salt or, you know, whatever else, sand, whatever else is in, is in them, um, it helps those vehicles deteriorate just that much more quickly. So it certainly seems that covering our um, investments at the very least would be something that would be in our best interests, not to mention um, the other issues that we have with um, the way that our, um, our salt shed is currently. And uh, even though I have to say you have, you and the Parks Department have been making a Herculean effort to clean up and find better ways to store some of our, um, our items that, that are used on a regular basis. And I am grateful and I'm sure that all of our residents are grateful for those efforts that you made. Um, you know, you can only do so much, I guess, with what we have. So um, I think that, you know, I know that for years, um, every highway superintendent has kind of had their, you know, their ears to the ground, that right? Um, to, you know, looking for uh, different opportunities to shift or move or, um, think about how we could do a better job um, with our highway department um, space. So thanks for bringing that up to the board's attention um, at a public meeting. We appreciate that. Um, and I'll just open it up again for any more questions or comments from any other members of the board. And I do know that Michael G has been talking about that for years. So. Yes, he has. Yep. He has indeed. Um, or had. Uh, and anybody else? Anybody else who's had the experience of spending a little time at the uh, highway department? I'll give a free tour if anybody wants to come. We definitely have some, uh, some wanting floors um, and uh, we wish that we could do a better job keeping them fixed up, but there are challenges that are built into the uh, current structure that make it very difficult for us to do so without um, investing a lot of money, I guess, into something that we're not sure is the best place to invest. Would you say that's fair to say, Pete? I would say so. It's probably, uh, you know, if we're going to stay here, over $300,000 to uh, upgrade. Okay. That's just your basic, bring it up to some modern standards, no addition or anything like that. Yeah. Okay. But I, that wouldn't, that really, wouldn't help us fit the trucks in there though. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Like the up, would the upgrades allow us to keep the equipment no, that you want inside? Basically or just fix up. Just bringing us up to the 21st century, you know, just, uh, yeah, the trucks would still be outside. That's, that's no building additions, just those regular maintenance, uh, the floor with drains and, you know, yeah. Thank you. Okay. And once again, any other questions, concerns, ideas? All right. Well, thank you very much, Mr. O'Connor. We are appreciate, appreciative of your um, bringing our attention to that matter. And I think that a next step might be uh, for us to draw on some of our consultants, like our town engineers and planner to work with you on um, maybe a rough needs assessment to consider what we need to plan for in terms of facilities improvements or possible future property acquisition. Okay, so with that, um, I'm not sure, I'm not seeing everybody on here, but we do have two departmental reports and I know we were expecting our clerk. Yeah. Not sure um, she's on yet. Yeah, supervisor, I'm sorry. I just received a message from her that she did have a family emergency this evening. So okay. she's not able to join us, but she, you know, certainly apologizes to the board and she'll, she's planning on joining us hopefully the uh, Wednesday after election day with a, with a nice update on uh, how all that went as well. So um, we'll schedule her for then and, you know, she apologizes and um, hopefully we'll hear from her soon. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so in that case, I think we're going to switch over to an update from our parks foreman, Mario Villardo, um, who's going to talk to us a little bit about the status of our parks. And you, you know, you've been very busy. Uh, I think, are you in one of our parks right now? I, I don't know where. No, no I'm in a Brewster Park. I'm at my son's baseball game. Okay. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hi. 
Um, okay, so you want to, um, so I think we have a PowerPoint presentation that you're sharing, and are you able to see that on your screen? Yeah, I see it. Okay. And um, just obviously, like everybody else, obviously COVID has certainly changed the way we operate this year. I mean, we started off real slow. March and April, things we normally did, we're doing in the spring, we were doing in June and July. Um, another thing that was an issue, especially at the waterfront this year, was garbage. Um, it's, I've been here 20 years, and it's the worst it's ever been. And it's not just from the weekends, it's every day. And it's just more people using our parks. Um, one new thing we do do is sanitize. Um, it's something we will continue to do on a regular work basis. And uh, we sanitize our playgrounds, workout equipment, which are getting a lot of use, um, benches, bleachers, uh, garbage cans, bathrooms, the art center, and our garage. So a lot of people are happy with it. It gives them some sense of comfort. So, I mean, if it's not raining, we, we plan to do it, and we are doing it on a daily basis. So, and now if you want to start the PowerPoint. Um, the first thing we did, um, we started in the winter. This, I didn't have any more before pictures, but this is one of the before pictures of our bathrooms. Um, you can see the stalls are rotting out, and this one actually had a leak in the ceiling. Um, the bright yellow paint, which we changed, and the floors were just a mess. We changed. Um, this is, well, in the process of doing it, we did new ceilings, new LED lights, new fans, um, new stalls. Um, we actually power washed. There was a picture, but it's not there. We actually took the walls down to and the floors down to nothing and just pretty much started from scratch. Um, priming paint. Um, you changed the. This was Gerlach. Um, as same thing, it was the new paint, the new ceilings, some of the new fixtures. We have our. Um, actually, all the fixtures we have are hands free. Um, the, the picture of the door, you see a green label. We actually installed uh, foot openers for all the outside doors so you don't have to use your hands and touch the handle. <clears throat> you can switch to. Okay. Um, this was the waterfront. Uh, same thing, all new fixtures, hands free. Um, the hand dryer, you can actually see a stainless steel um, wall plate we put so it's easier to clean and it just. Before you're getting, yeah, I see the little mouse. <laughs> Before you're getting all the dirt and grime like embedded into the block walls, and it was difficult to clean. So now we were just able to clean stainless steel and just keep everything looking clean and fresh. This was the men's bathroom. Same thing. On, oh, another thing is um, they each have the uh, the uh, wall-mounted uh, garbage cans, which you see over by the hand dryer. And same thing. Everything is hands-free. Um, the only thing we're waiting on is the soap dispensers. Um, hopefully, I just spoke to the guy today. We'll have them next week. So then we'll have to just install those. Okay. Um, this was from the Storm Laura. Um, we had a lot of trees and brush come down. Not too much damage. I ride a park. You see by the scoreboard, um, just a tree fell on the fence. It really didn't damage it because it landed on its branches. The... Um, the wooden thing you see in the playground is the um, Kaga pit that got damaged. We just had to replace some boards. And it just took, I think, like four or five days just to go through all the parks in the cemetery and just clean everything up. Okay. This is 9-11 Memorial before the 9-11 ceremony. Um, we just freshened up the, the beds and planted uh, mums. Okay. Next. This was a uh, Ryder Park. We actually had a lot of well, two or three trees come down this area where you see by the road, there's a pipe. And that was actually a drainage that leads to another pipe, a swale. It hasn't been cleaned out in years. So it's, since we were there with the machines, we actually, if you look to the pictures on the left, you'll see the swale dug out. So now the water can move freely from the road into the other pipe. And it dried up the area because we were always getting stuck when it was wet. Um, this field prep we would normally do in the spring. We ended up doing it in June. Um, obviously, it was a lot worse than what it would have been in the spring. We were able to get them done, and they started, I think, the second, third week in June playing. Okay. 
this is just more field prep. Um, the netting, you can see the, the bucket truck, the netting was down, so we had to put that back up. We had uh, Kenny from the village, Streetlight One, come over and help us. Where you see Mark on that green piece of turf, um, it was just a heavy foot traffic area, and every time it rained, it always filled with water, so we used some turf, and uh, it eliminated that problem. And it's been working. Is that leftover turf from the school? Yes, it is. Nice. This is where uh, windows at Gerlach, um, they were all smashed up in the ADA bathroom. That's with the red wall. So obviously we just put them in new. And the other men's and women's, they were missing for years. So we were able to just put them in. And we're planning to wash and hopefully paint the outside of the building, but that probably won't get done until the spring or next year. This was some of the illegal dumping we were having. That was another issue we were having this year. Um, this was actually a Sally Swope. Um, we actually went in there and opened the area up so it's visible from the road. So hopefully people stop dumping and they haven't dumped. It's been a couple weeks now. And Gerlach has been another problem spot where we're getting people dumping stuff. Um, this was to deal with all the garbage at the waterfront. We uh, bought new garbage cans with tops and recycling uh, uh, cans. We now have a total of 26 between garbage cans and recycling cans at the waterfront alone. Okay. Are they all getting used? Absolutely. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's not as bad now. It's actually slowed down, but it was pretty bad. Um, this was just when, after we cleaned the ramp and put our uh, docks in at the waterfront. This was a ballard we installed at the waterfront at the, in front of the beach at that area. So to prevent cars from uh, driving in there. Okay. This was, uh, we cleared the rocks. The two pit first pictures are just overgrown weeds that were going into the rocks. We actually cleared the whole point side. Okay. This was another, well, it wasn't really swell. This was a clogged pipe by the caretaker's house. Um, we actually thought the pipe went a different way. So then I think this was before Laura. We actually did some investigating work and we found it right to the right of the caretaker's house. So we unclogged it and all this water came out. I like it, wasn't it? Okay. You say us? I don't remember. Huh? Isn't this I, don't, I keep saying Laura. I don't know why. That's my sister's name. It wasn't. It wasn't Laura. No. What was it? <laughs> Isaias. I. -S -S -I -A oh. I don't know why. Was there wasn't a storm, Laura? I mean, there probably was, but I don't know. If oh. That was not <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Maybe just me yeah. being mad at my sister. That's that's why I called it that. <laughs> um, this was just uh before. I don't have app at the fridges, but obviously. Um, the swing set, all was covered in weeds, all the playgrounds were. We pulled the weeds and then we put new mulch. I don't have a picture. I forgot to take it of what the new mulch, but all the weeds are gone and there's mulch now. Okay. This was uh, a ride of park. Um, we had a couple cracks in the paving that we had done like six years ago. Um, we're going to try to make this a regular yearly or every two years uh part of our maintenance now so this was just some crack repairs on the sidewalk and the paving okay and then we actually the next picture yeah then we sealed it we sealed the walkway we sealed all the paving and met the new paving so hopefully next year we'll do no next it's like every two years so ride a park was paved last year so maybe into what 21 22 we'll hopefully start sealing everything else and just to prevent it from cracking and just keeping up on maintenance because everything plus we're getting a lot of new paving and most of the parks and hopefully in the upcoming years we'll finish parks that haven't been done <clears throat> okay no backwards this is uh the tennis courts at Ryder park um we closed them obviously because of covid covid in the spring um we never opened them back up um some of the cracks did get worse and weeds started growing in them. So we actually 
cut out all the weeds. We power washed the tennis courts. We uh, cleaned out all the cracks. Um, we dug for new posts. And we're working with this company, Seal Masters, that they give us, um, it's called this patch binder, which is made this special kind of liquid um, that goes into the cracks and fills them. And then you skim coat. And that's what it looks like now with all the crack repairs. There should be one more. Yes. There's a couple areas that we had to cut out um, and just put new uh, turf, um, turf, um, new uh, court mix asphalt down. Um, so this is just the first step. The next step will be a membrane and then a resurfacer and then they will be painted. And this is only the top court because the bottom courts are just a whole nother issue. Okay. Uh, this was um, some damage we had to our service going down towards Ryder Park. Um, there were three poles that were leaning. Um, one, the wire in between the fields came down and that gave power to our bathrooms, scoreboard, and uh, our scoreboards for both fields and the sprinklers. This was a new scoreboard we installed. Um, the Lee uh, Mossening uh, Baseball League um, purchased it. So we had to take the old one down and um, we installed a new scoreboard. The boxes you see, the pictures you see on the left are boxes they had mounted in the dugout. That's where they keep their uh, controls. Okay. Um, this is actually what we're working on now. Um, we missed the growing season in the spring, so hopefully we'll be able to grow grass now. Um, all the new paving we had done, we're finally getting to put topsoil, seed, and hay. So we started up by the rocks there, by the back of the park where the pavilion would be, and we'll, we'll, we made it down to the caretaker's house actually today. Okay. Um, Cedar Lane, in the, before the garden opened, we, uh, at the gardens, we had to install a sink. We actually ran hot water, hot and cold water out there, put a soap dispenser, and we tied the sink into the uh, pump station. We had the small pump station behind the building. Okay. This is uh, the art center. Um, obviously, oh, we didn't have to change the toilets, the fixtures. We just uh, added the hands-free flushometer, hands-free faucets, and the, uh, the wall shield, the stainless steel, the wall shield underneath the dryer. And we actually, the water, the hot water tank went, so we had this Eco Smart uh, tankless hot water system that we were going to put in our shop, but we couldn't because it just drew too much power and we didn't have enough amps in our shop. So we saved it and we installed it in, uh, I think, June. No, or I don't know when, sometime in July or August, we installed the hot water tank at the art center. And that's what you see on the picture on the left. Um, before the dog park, we obviously it was locked because of COVID. All the weeds grew in, so we went in, cleared out all the weeds. We just see some on the left, and then we spread wood chips. Um, it's a lot easier now with our skid steer. That's actually a snowblower attachment we have for our skid steer. It's actually able to, as you see in that middle picture, to shoot the wood chips, which makes it a lot easier and a lot faster to uh, get it done. Okay. Yes. Okay. Change. This is the dock. No, we're in the dock. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, this is the dock at uh, Cedar Cedar Lane. Um, got it from a company in uh, Maine. Um, they came down. They installed it. Um, we helped them, and we did install. So should be another picture. No. You see it. There goes, yeah. yeah, so we, uh, I don't know if you could see, but there's a rope that goes around because we didn't want everything to look aluminum or like all the handrails, so we wanted a nice natural look. So on the top is just, well, the top two, uh, you call it a rail, it's actually a rope, a thick rope that goes around. And on the bottom would be a cedar board right above the, uh, the face of the deck. And then we installed solar caps on each four by four post. Um, we did every other post a solar cap, which unfortunately people are stealing. Um, four, four or five are missing. 
And then the other ones just have regular wooden caps. And we did secure them, but yes, we didn't do a good job. <laughs> but that's our dock at the sea dome. That's great. This is a, uh, we ran a new water line for the food scraps. Um, just so people could wash out their bins after they bring it. So we dug the trench and we took our sock cutter and we actually cut it first so we could save the grass. So you see the second picture once we were done. So it looked like nothing was there, was done. We just put the grass right back and that was that. And it works. Great. Okay. <clears throat> This was a tree that came down. Um, this is a, we just had to go there and cut it and clean it with the excavator. This was at Dale Cemetery. We actually, we actually had a big tree come down at Sparta, which is not there. And uh, we had a doubt came during that storm we had. And we actually made a little opening so we could actually access it a lot better. And every time we go to cut grass now, we don't have to climb the wall. So. That makes it easier for us too. This is um, Dale Cemetery. We had a couple of stones leaning, so we went and uh, we took the stones off. You see the third picture. That's actually hooked up to our excavator. Picks up the stone. We dig down to two feet, three feet, whatever it is, depending on the size of the stone. We pour new concrete, which is the first picture, and then we put everything back together. Upcoming winter projects. Oh, I don't know about this one. <laughs> no, um, yeah, I guess rider tennis courts, that would be, the rest of it would be in the spring. Sally Swope, I know I promised you, Liz, we would be there in the spring, but it didn't happen. I, I'm, uh, I'm sorry. But uh, after we finish the dirt, we will be there. So hopefully we finish the dirt this week at Ryder, and then next week we will be at Sally Swope. Um, paving and lining the Muga would be in the spring. The caretaker's house. Um, I don't know if that will be done this winter. Um, that will be contracted. Uh, that stuff will be contracted out anyway, as well as ice roof repairs and benches at Bug Johnson. That actually might be done before the winter. And that's it for now. Well, fantastic. Looks like you have been pretty darn busy. Uh, thank you so much. There's okay. a lot of great work there, and um, I'm sure that there's even lots of other things that um, – are little things that you do every day and we greatly appreciate it. So um, does anybody have questions about any of the work that's been done or what's coming up and down the road? Board? How much damage did we take to Sally Swope during that storm? I thought I saw a bunch of trees down. There's a lot of trees. I know there, there was a lot on the edge of the road too. Um, that's I don't think I anything, them. yeah. Um, I know, I guess when they clear the road, they just push them in. We will clean that all. We actually, the first thing we're going to do is actually clean up all the trees and just really clean up first before we start doing any drainage or anything like that. But there's like four or five big trees that came down that I saw. And then the garbage we went in, they actually, I wasn't there when they went to go clean. I was off that day, but there was a whole, what was it, 12-yard container full of garbage there that we didn't see because everything was so overgrown. No comment. So, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. But it won't be happening in the spring because we will – it's our next project. So, like I said, next week, hopefully, we will be there. Great. Right. Well, that's good news. We're, well, Liz and I will be there on a regular basis um, to see all that. That's definitely going to deserve a ribbon button because that's 20-plus yeah. sure. years of just neglect there. Yeah. Is that how many years it is? Is that how? Well, I've been here twenty years. Nah, no, nah, actually, no, nah, it's not. I'm sorry, I've been here that long. It's now nah, maybe fifteen. Then the first couple of years, so say like ten years. Ten just, at least. Yeah. We were working on a couple of other um, initiatives. We were hoping to get some folks together to help um, with some of the invasives and uh, vine cutting. Um, that which I guess that should have been on the winter projects list because Mario told me that that's what they were going to be doing this winter is cutting all the. Uh, vines off of the trees. Um, but we have not yet heard back from some of the people we reached out to. So we're, we're still hopeful that we might find um, some groups of volunteers who are interested in um, doing a little uh, work at Ryder on some of the invasive clearings and supporting our buffer in the bags and other things that we've put in place. Um, 
where we've tried to grow some new and healthy um, trees and shrubs. Um, we're also hoping that we can get some folks to help us on an ongoing basis at Sally Swope. So this is a call to anybody watching this meeting who is interested in this. If you are and want to help out, give, uh, give me a call during the day or email me at dlevenberg at townofaustin.com. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Wiltshire, did you have a question? I think you were raising your hand. No, I'm, I'm fine. Uh, hey, Mr. Wiltshire, how are you doing? Okay, how are you? Good, did thank I, you. Did I just hear you say you took off today? No, 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 no. <laughs> no, the day they went to go clean off Sally's floor. No, I was at work today. Because <laughs> I, I was about to say, I didn't think you ever had a day off. <laughs> <laughs> actually, this year was the first year I actually took almost two weeks off straight. All right, summer. all right. So, yeah. I think you, you guys are doing a great job. Hang in Thank there. You. Thank you. It's good seeing you. Hey, Mario. Yes. Um, that new water line in the, by the food scraps program, do we have to drain that in, for the winter? It doesn't yeah. look that deep. No, I drain it because I drain the garden. No, it's not. Yeah, no, it's just regular uh, sprinkler line, like the gardens, like how the garden was done. So we blow out okay. the garden anyway. So that's, yeah, right. we got to blow out the sink this year and then the, the food scrap line. Yes. Okay, so we when does that? When it depends, we usually do everything together, like the sprinklers, the bathrooms. So depends on, I mean, this month and early November, maybe it, before it freezes. Definitely, no, definitely before it freezes. I think okay. that might be happening before Sally Swope. Don't worry, Councilman Feldman. No, that'll be put on. That'll be put on the list before Sally Swope. No, no. You no, think no. it's funny? It's not funny. I don't think it's funny. It's not funny <laughs> at all. I do not think it's funny. That's not, not the case, so you're wrong. Um, anybody else, uh, council members, who would like to uh, talk about um, uh, the The dock at Cedar Lane looks fantastic. I really like it. Great job Thank there. You. And just Thank a you. shout out to also to uh, Senator Carlucci's office. Um, and uh, they helped come up with funding for that. I don't think we've applied yet for the reimbursement, but we will. And um, I also give a shout out to Fern Quesada for all her help. Um, she really helped us get the, uh, the folks from Maine to follow through on their bid. And we think the dock is beautiful and it was something that we had uh, seen a long time ago. So um, she helped wrangle those, those folks and get them here. So thank yes. you. Thank you, Fern. And is there anybody else with questions or comments about any of the other projects? It's an awful lot and there's, it's never, it never stops, it never ends. We never stop getting complaints about every little thing. And if it's not one thing, it's keeping up with everything. And we hope that uh, we can continue to uh, support our parks since they're seemingly getting more use than any other part of our government right now. Um, and certainly the infrastructure is being tapped to its fullest. So we will continue to look for ways that we can um, make improvements and uh, find ways to make it easier, hopefully, uh, to continue to uh, keep up the, with the parks, all the work that's there. So thanks again, um, Mario. And uh, I think that's it for you. We'll see you around the park. Thank you. Enjoy the rest hey, of your game. Hope nice. Sandra's team. Uh, they got they got mercy. They what? <laughs> it just ended actually. They got mercy. Uh, uh, it, just, it just ended. Yeah, they played a club team for the first time. They just oh, they lost ten zero. So I'm pretty. All right. All right. Have nah. a good night. Okay. All right. Good night, everybody. You. See you guys soon. Bye. All right, so up next at our last legislative session, we opened a public hearing on proposed legislation to create beekeeping regulations in the town of Austin. At that hearing, we received some good comments and some feedback from the public, some of which we have incorporated into our latest draft of the local law. The public hearing has been continued to our next legislative session. So tonight, we're going to give the board an opportunity to discuss some of these changes and ask questions of our planning consultant, Valerie Manastra. Valerie, do you want to walk us through some of the latest changes to the draft to start our discussion? Sure, I'd be happy to. So um, I'm going to highlight the first change that we're suggesting, or I've suggested, deals with the site colony density. This was in response to public comment uh, that was raised concerning the number of apiaries on a particular property. So we are still suggesting
suggesting that in, in uh, no event shall hives be kept on a lot smaller than 10,000 square feet, but we are now suggesting that one apiary shall be permitted for lots up to 40,000 square feet. And then after 40,000 square feet, um, lots shall be permitted an additional apiary for each additional 40,000 square feet of lot area up to a total of six apiaries. So basically this is saying that for each acre you have of land, approximately an acre of land, you get a, to um, install another apiary on your site up to a total of six apiaries, which if you do this particular calculation for six acres of land, you could potentially have six apiaries. Um, there, if you have 10 acres of land, the law at that point is still stopping it at six apiaries, specifically because after you start getting above six apiaries, you really are at the point where you're maybe commercializing your beekeeping, and that is not the intent of the law. They're really the intent of the law is to allow for people to um, do it as a recreational type of um, use. So the second item, um, or before I go on, is there any questions with um, that particular change? Okay. Can't hear you. Uh, Liz, I think you're muted. What is the acreage of the minimum size lot? I don't know what 10,000 square feet translates Quarter to. Quarter acre. Quarter. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. So then uh, colony. So now we wanted to address a little bit more about additional setbacks. I think there was some concern from the public. Again, how close the apiaries can be to um, particular plot lines. So what we are saying is for one apiary, for example, still we're still suggesting that it must be located at least 75 feet from the public sidewalk, alley, or street, or road, and at least 25 feet from a side or rear lot line. But for um, lots greater than 40,000 square feet, if you, um, those are lots that are more apt to have multiple apiaries on site, we're suggesting that all apiaries must be located at least 100 feet from public sidewalks, alleys, streets, or roads, and at least 100 feet from the side or rear lot line. That came in response into a little bit of, I um, had a few discussions with, um, with the uh, Fernando, um, and he pointed out that if for some reason you don't want a situation where somebody has four different apiaries, and they only have it 25 feet from their lot line. So this, re, this will then require that if you have additional apiaries on your property, you will have a larger setback than when um, then will be required for one apiary. Makes sense. Are there any questions with that particular change? Okay. So another comment came in, and this is one we're not recommending to make a change for. Our comment came in uh, dealing with the flyaway barrier, and the question was raised as to whether a vegetative barrier or a solid barrier, if one is better than the other. And uh, with additional research, uh, I found that neither one is, um, you know, is a better uh, flyaway barrier. So we are still recommending to keep either vegetative or another type of, you know, um, non-vegetative flyaway barrier. Okay. Then a comment came in also dealing with the types of bees. And again, we originally had New York native bee species or honeybee species, but it seems that based upon additional research that actually New York native bee species are not, um, they, they're not really sold on the market and it's really the honeybee species that people would be most likely buying. So we are removing the specifically New York native bee species. Then the other change that we're also recommending, again, this comes with uh, concerns on what is really going to be considered a nuisance of the original language had the presence of bees from a bee colony or neighboring or nearby properties in significant quantities, except for behaviors that are necessary for routine foraging. And the concern was, but what if for some reason routine foraging actually becomes more, becomes a nuisance. So we are suggesting removing that um, exception and that, in, and, uh, that a nuisance would be um, identified if there were just significant quantities of bees. And to a larger extent, uh, bees should not be, if the bees are really foraging in mass quantities, it's, it's potentially that the property owner is not providing enough food, water, and that type of um, environmental, you know, um, you know, not providing enough food, water, and the proper environment for the bees. Yeah, that makes sense too. 
All right, I have a question so, back to the native species. What if somebody, for some weird reason, wanted to keep them? Shouldn't we just leave it in there? We can. I mean, it's really um, neither here nor there. I think the biggest concern is that if for some reason somebody did approach the town and said, well, I can where can I find native bee species? And the reality is, I don't know if they're, they're actually sold on the market, but it's right. possible that at some point in time they could be. Um, and it's also possible that- Or uh, somebody moves a hive. You know, exactly. So, I mean, that's possible. So if you want, I don't see, there's, there's no reason not, I mean, to remove it, except for the fact that, you know, we're encouraging people to um, buy a species. species. Yeah. Probably not. I mean, it's also, almost like, I mean, you should you should look for native species, especially because that seems to, in general, be something that people would think, oh, this is a good thing, and then you can't find them. Right. I get that, that but if, if, uh, when it reads the other way, doesn't that exclude them? It doesn't seem mandatory. It says every effort should be made to utilize bees or queens from New York native species or honeybee species. So it seems more kind of advisory and direct than, than mandatory. I mean, do you read it that way, Valerie? Yes, I just didn't, you know, knowing that okay. you know, after a little bit of research that if somebody was to really purchase native bee species, I don't think that they're available on the market, but we can leave it in there if you prefer. As long as it doesn't say you, you can't have them, as long as it says um, recommend no. and not require then I'm fine with it either way. Okay. Okay. Um, so that, that basically summarizes the uh, changes to the proposed law based upon public comment that we heard. And again, I had a follow-up conversation with Fernando Gonzalez and, you know, who spoke at the last public hearing about his beekeeping experiences those are the suggestions that I'm making. That's great. Are there any other comments, suggestions, questions that anybody has about the, um, the revisions that uh, Valerie is suggesting? Or any other parts of the beekeeping legislation or any comments about the public hearing comments? I mean, I think I, I appreciate um, the responsiveness and the research that you did to get a little bit more information. And it's nice that we have our, uh, our local um, expert, Fernando. Um, I think that, you know, some of the comments were good and helpful and hopefully they will um, not make it harder for people to, to, to keep bees and, but to do so in a responsible way that uh, doesn't become a nuisance to the neighbors and um, actually helps um, possibly pollinate some of the vegetation that would be a, a good thing I think anybody else have any absolutely questions? and I think yeah, go ahead I'm sorry Valerie go ahead no I was going to say in the next steps um Christy can clearly talk about the next steps procedurally but after the after we we focus and finalize the language for the uh, local law I'll be starting to work on the actual language for the permit and then so that will also come back to the board too for your review as well. Okay, great. Okay, is that it then for everybody? No questions, comments? Christy? So we did, we referred this to the Westchester County Planning Board um, as required by general municipal law. Um, we received a response from them back saying this was a matter of local determination. Um, you have to do it for zoning tax amendments. So um, we were gonna have to wait 30 days for them to respond, but they've already done so. so um, I don't know, Valerie, would you recommend waiting until we have the forms in place for the board to move forward with adopting the local law? Do you think just from a logistics standpoint, that would be like the most efficient way to go? I, probably at this point. I mean, unless there's an immediate need to have this particular law on the, uh, within the zoning code. I mean, because to some extent, I know it has to go up to general code, doesn't it? And it takes a, a little bit of time. So we might be able to even be able to have the permit ready by the time it gets, you know, incorporated into general code. Um, but that's really up to the board. So I guess the, the, as the supervisor mentioned, the public hearing is scheduled to be continued next week on October 13th. Um, I guess, depending upon what kind of feedback the board gets, 
you could consider closing the public hearing and potentially even voting on the local law. Um, as Valerie mentioned, we do have to send it to the Department of State and that usually takes about a week to a week and a half um, for them to process. So um, we could get that ball rolling while Valerie's working on finalizing the forms. Of course, depending on what kind of comments you get at the meeting next week, we'll have to- Sure. Yeah, but I think it would be good to be prepared to, to close the public hearing if we don't get a lot of other comments. We can have a resolution prepared for the board to consider. And if the board decides not to close the public hearing for whatever reason, you can just table the resolution. That sounds perfect. Everybody good with that? Yes, thank and you. And then I can, anticipate, I can try to, for the October 20th, I believe I'm coming back for that work session anyhow. Um, so I can have a permit, uh, a draft permit ready for the board to review as well for that meeting. Awesome. Sounds good. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, and now we have, I think, let's see, one more topic on our work session agenda. So it's an interesting one because we just recently adopted a local law to make it easier for our restaurants to expand to outdoor spaces. Um, but now as we're getting into the colder months, we're looking around at some of our neighbors and we're starting to see some changes to the restaurants who have spaces outside in other municipalities. And we're seeing that in fact, they have enclosed tents and heaters. And just a few months ago, when we were looking at this local law, we said we really didn't want people to have sides because we thought that it was you know, safer for people to be eating outside. And the extension that we were giving restaurants to expand their space outdoors um, at this difficult time, when we trying to help our businesses not lose business, um, seemed like it made the most sense to do in outdoor space. But because local restaurants have their indoor spaces restricted, um, they can actually gain indoor capacity if they are allowed to put up sides on their tents. Um, and we wanted to just think and talk a little bit about if maybe we have to go back and adjust our local law um, and think about allowing tents with side flaps and portable heaters um, in that extended space outdoors. So basically they would then be required to follow not the outdoor restrictions, which are, are not as great, but the indoor restrictions of uh, whatever it is, 50% capacity, I think at this point. Um, so it would still allow them to, you know, basically expand their capacity back up to their, depending on how big the outdoor extension is, um, up a little bit from what they had with just their indoor space available. Um, but, um, you know, it, it wouldn't be, they wouldn't have as many tables available as they, as without the flaps. So we have noticed again, just on some of our neighboring municipalities, we're starting to see these tents appear with the flaps and we wanted to just see how the board felt um, about this topic and if you think we should reconsider. Um, you said there were tents with flaps and heaters. Isn't that a carbon monoxide worry? I mean, I think we ha we'd have to make sure that they followed all the fire codes and any other New York state codes as well as the COVID codes. Um, so people couldn't put up anything that wasn't safe. We're not, I know right now I have seen some heaters up for tents that don't have sides, but um, I'm not sure if they're putting the heaters in the tents with the sides or not. Um, I haven't actually been inside the tents that I see around, but um, I think that uh, our building inspector believes that it might be safe, I think, depending on what type of heaters they are. So I don't think they're all, I don't think they're all gas heaters. I, I, I want to, I, yeah. Go ahead. We need, I'm sorry. Yeah, we need John to come and talk to us before we change, in my opinion. I don't know what Jackie, Jackie. Uh, where I was going, so would we be mandating what types of heaters and, and I, I, yeah, there is definitely a safety concern with heaters and tents. So I Again, guess we have to be yeah. really mindful of what kind of heaters and, and what kind of tents and I, I, I don't know. So, right, so all of this is part of the permitting process. You can't just go and throw up a tent and 
uh, do whatever you want. You have to still go through the building department to do this. So if you were going to change what you had, you would be required to go back to the building department and our building inspector, who's also our fire inspector, would have to approve it. And before that's before you could have the tent in whatever configuration you have, he would have to approve how many tables you could have and what if you had sides and what kind of heaters you, you were, would be allowed to use with whatever your configuration is. And if you didn't get that approval, then it wouldn't be permitted. I would very much support it. I, you know, even if there's some level of concern with having the tents down as far as COVID's concerned, I think it's 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 much reduced than having people jammed inside into restaurants. So I think if we could alleviate that concern, uh, the, the concern about the fire issue, I think we should try to do it. I just, you know, I just want to do whatever we can to support our businesses and make sure that everybody's safe. So obviously we're not going to ask anybody to, or tell anybody that it's okay to do some, something that isn't safe. And again, that would be have to have to be something that would be approved by. And I, I think that, um, you know, we had sort of just put it out to, to John initially if what he thought about it and he's in support of that. So um, again, he would work, he would go and work with our, but I think we have five restaurants who have outdoor spaces right now along our state road that um, this would pertain to. And um, that is um, plus, you know, plus uh, the one that is not on our state road and um, that it would, you know, that that's who it would apply to. So he would have to go and individually work with each one of them to get them to a safe place. If in fact they wanted even to pursue this and you no, know, these are not expensive additions. So they may want to just take their chances and keep things the way they are with the open sides. Um, maybe that means that they can have more, more patrons. Um, that would be left to them to decide. And who knows, maybe we have a mild winter. So with that, we'll get some advice from John maybe, and um, perhaps either Christy or Valerie, I'm not sure which one of you would help us to evaluate if we can um, extend uh, or change our local law and we'd have to go through the whole public hearing process again. It would literally be deleting one phrase unless there were other recommendations from John in conjunction with it, but it would, it would be minimal in terms of drafting. Okay. We still have to go back to the public for public hearing. Yeah, you would it would be amending the local law. So you would have to do, go through the same process again. I, I think it would be um, obviously possibly shorter um, because instead of contemplating the entire law that you were looking at over the summer, um, now it's just a, a relatively minor um, textual amendment. So that would be your main focus. So it, it would probably go more quickly. Okay. Okay. So is there, is that, does that sound like a plan that we'll go back to John Hamilton and see if he has any specific uh, concerns, if he wants anything additional woven into that uh, law or if he wants to maybe just change the permit um, and then we'll come back to the board with uh, the recommendation of how, how we would phrase it um, to amend the local law. Generally yes or can I give a, a thumbs yes. up for that sounding good? Okay, okay. Okay, fantastic. Um, okay, so with that I think I would take a motion to adjourn to executive session for Personnel, advice of counsel, and contracts. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Awesome. So just as a reminder, our offices will be closed Monday, October 12th for the holiday. We'll be back next Tuesday, October 13th with a regular meeting via Zoom. We just received word this week that Governor Cuomo has extended the executive order allowing meetings to continue to be held remotely via video, video conferencing through November 3rd, and we anticipate the governor will continue to extend these orders monthly for the foreseeable future. We have, of course, asked if there's some way that uh, the governor's office could let us know if they decide that they're not planning to extend it so we can have a heads up on that. We'll certainly keep all of you posted. Uh, we hope you have a great night. Everyone, enjoy the beautiful fall foliage. Don't forget to tune in to Organ Donor Enrollment Zoomathon on the face Town of Austin Facebook page on Thursday afternoon, starting around three o'clock. And we will see you right back here on Zoom next Tuesday night. Have a great week, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.